Philemon is a super short letter written by the Apostle Paul, but it packs a big punch. As we're confronted with the reality that the love of Christ should be something that owns the lives of God's children, compelling us to love God and love people. In fact, the gospel without love is not the gospel. This is Philemon, and we are Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. We're going to start with Bible trivia, and I really, this doesn't get any easier than this one. And I gave you some clues even while I was reading this. I mean, I really did. I just wanted everyone to win today. There's one letter the Apostle Paul wrote in which he never once explicitly mentions the death of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus. Does anybody have a guess which letter that is? Anybody? It's this easy. I just read from it. It starts with a phi, ends with a leman. Anybody want to take a guess? Philemon, that's right. Good job. See, you win the prize, which is nothing but just pride, I guess. Or uh, Anyway, yeah, adoration. You already had that. Philemon is the only letter that Paul writes where he does not explicitly mention the death or the resurrection of Jesus. He doesn't have to, by the way, because in this letter, we're going to see it today, he is going to model the gospel with his very life. And it's beautiful as we watch it play out. He's going to show us what the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus accomplished on our behalf through his, through his actions. If you remember the summary of Philemon, again, it's only a two-week series because it's such a short letter. It's only 25 verses. The summary of Philemon we gave last week is that the love of Christ should be something that owns the lives of God's children. That it should take ownership of our lives. That the love of Christ, the true love of Christ that it was seen in Scripture, that should take ownership of our lives. Should own us. The name of this sermon, this short sermon series is Philemon, free of all but love. Right? The true freedom is not without constraints. And the truest freedom is found under the constraints of Christ's love. Okay? And that love compels us to love God and love people. The gospel without love is not the gospel at all. Today, the good news is this, because we're going to see it. We saw it a little bit last week. We'll see it even more explicitly this week, is that true gospel-saturated love points straight to Jesus, which matters because, again, I know last week as Philemon was honored, we spent last week looking at some verses that honored Philemon, We saw him loving in such an extraordinary way the body of Christ that maybe we were challenged by that. Maybe we felt a little bit inadequate. Maybe we felt like, man, I'm not living up to that standard. This week, we might be tempted to feel that way again as we see Paul's example of love and Philemon's example of love and Onesimus' example of love. That's why we have to look to the, the cross, the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Jesus meets us in our failings to love like he loves. Jesus meets us in our debts. Jesus meets us in our sins with love so that we can say today, and this is the point of the whole thing, love does. Yes, it's active. And and for us, love is a doing thing. It should be. And we're going to see those actions play out. But love does because Jesus did. Love doesn't do because we've got the power to do it. Love doesn't do uh, love doesn't do things because we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Love does because Jesus did, and it's Jesus who transforms our lives and makes us capable of loving as well. So yes, love is active, but only because Jesus' work on the cross is finished. We have to be anchored there today. Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. I have nothing to give. In and of myself, nothing, no wisdom. Only what you have to give us matters today. And so might you give it to us freely by your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. In verses 8 through 16, right? So we looked at 1 through 7 last week. We'll finish out the letter this week to Philemon. In verses 8 through 16, we we uh, saw Philemon, or in verses 8 through 16 today, we'll see through Paul that love does. And we'll see what love looks like when it is actively doing something. Love is not 
a statement, right? Love is a verb, an action verb, right? It is an engagement type of thing. But first, the backstory, and we caught a little bit of it last week, but just the short of it. So Philemon lives in a town called Colossae. He was likely saved in a town called Ephesus. We uh, went through the book of Ephesians towards the end of the spring. That letter to the church at Ephesus was carried by a man named Tychicus and a man named Onesimus. They went together. Paul's in prison in Rome. They sailed from Rome east across the Mediterranean Sea. They uh, ported in, if that's even the right term for that, they ported in Ephesus, delivered the letter to Ephesus to the church there, probably spent some time sharing what message Paul, other messages Paul had for that church. And then they continued east inland to a place called Colossae. And they still had two letters in their hands. The letter to the church at Colossae, which is called Colossians in your Bible, and the letter to Philemon, this letter right here. What's interesting is that Onesimus is carrying the letter to his former master. Okay, now we as Americans look at slavery as great uh, as the greatest, probably scar and evil. Probably is not even the right word in the history of America. All right. And so we see slavery, you know, as for the in a way that because the way it was here, people were bought as property. They were infinitely held and their families generationally held as property as slaves. Onesimus was a slave, but not in that way. So you have to kind of disconnect from that. There was slavery like that in the Roman Empire, but it was not the normal version of slavery. The normal version of what's called slavery or or referred to as slavery in the New Testament is indentured servitude. Okay, so someone is either uh, criminally in debt or financially in debt. And so they then sell themselves Autonomy with their own autonomy, they sell themselves into slavery to pay back that debt. So they make a legal agreement with their owner. I will work for you for X amount of time as a payment for this criminal debt or this financial debt. It's almost equivocally certain that that's the type of slavery that Onesimus was in. He was legally contracted to Philemon as his master. He served Philemon, no one else. He served the interest of Philemon and Philemon's home until that legal contract was completed. We have no details about how long it was or what it was, but we know that Philemon fled. He had a falling out, or not Philemon, Onesimus fled. He had a falling out with Philemon and Colossae, and he left. A lot of scholars speculate that he even stole from Philemon on the way out the door. And he flees, he flees to Rome to get away from his master. So he is wrong. He's broken the law. He has wronged his master. He's broken his promise to Philemon. He's likely ripped him off in in a very dramatic way. And he's gone. But in Rome, he meets Paul. He doesn't just meet Paul. He meets Jesus. God saves him in Rome He hears the truth of the gospel, which he'd likely heard from Philemon, from Paul, and he believes and he becomes a Christian. And now Paul is sending him back to Philemon with a massive request for Philemon. To forgive him. To reconcile with him. That's the context of this letter. Philemon likely is carrying it in his own hand as he walks with Tychicus. He may or may not know the contents of the letter. I don't know. But Philemon is going to open it up. And as he as we read last week, he's going to say, you need to read this with your wife. You need to read this with your son. And not only that, but you need to read it with the whole church that meets in your house. There needs to be some accountability. So he butters Philemon up, but not in some disingenuous way. But last week we saw how much he loves Philemon, Paul does. He honors him, but now he makes the ask. And what we see as he makes the ask is that love does. And love does with a posture of humility. That's the first thing we see in verses 8 and 9. Love does with a posture of humility. This is Paul speaking to Philemon. He says, accordingly, 
though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, I love that, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. Now, what he's doing there with the old man stuff is, is he's using a, a Greek word he's written there that can be translated old man or ambassador. Most translators translated old man. I don't know why. I'm not smart enough to understand why. But either way, Paul's appealing to, remember, this is going to be read by the whole church. So it's an interesting letter in that sense. Paul's not trying to brag, but Paul is bringing everyone into the context. He's saying, know this, I am an apostle. I am Paul. That was what ambassador would carry with it. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I'm an old man. I've lived this for a long, long time. And you notice he mentioned he's in prison too. And I'm in prison for this. You can trust what I'm saying. I have been faithful all the way to prison chains for this message. I'm old. I've lived it out. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm an apostle. I have the authority to share these things. And so I could come in here with a heavy hand, play the apostle card. I could come in here saying, you know, respect your elders and do what I say. But instead, love. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. The main point here is humility. He could have flexed his muscles, but he doesn't. He could have leveraged his authority, but he doesn't for the sake of love. Listen, if you observe someone trying to convince someone of something, which is what Paul's about to do with Philemon, to try to convince him of something. Watch somebody try to convince someone of something, and you can learn real quick if love is what motivates them. If love is what motivates us. Right? Do we pull rank when we're trying to convince somebody of something? Do we drop our resume? Do we manipulate the situation? I know I do sometimes to get what I want. I leverage my gifts, my skills, my talents, my position to get what I want. Or do we act for the sake of love? Paul says, for the sake of love, I will humbly come to you. Hear me, true love doesn't wear arrogance. That's out of style in true love fashion. True love wears humility. So true love does with a posture of humility. Not only that, but love does with a passion for people. Look at Paul's heart for Onesimus. I appeal to you for my child, he says, Onesimus whose father I became in my imprisonment. Those are terms of love. That's endearment that he has for him. Paul can't avoid a good joke, though, and you'll see that. It says, formerly he was useless to you. And this is funny. If you know what Onesimus is, it's already funny that he would even say that. And Onesimus is there reading it, too. He goes, I was? I was useless? Onesimus' name means useful or beneficial. That's what Onesimus means. In fact, a lot of indentured servants would be given that name with hopes that they would be useful and beneficial. And so he says, formerly, useful was useless. Remember that? He was he wouldn't do anything you told him to. You guys had this falling out. He ripped you off. He left. He was of no use to you. But things have changed. God changed him. He now is indeed useful to you and to me, Paul says. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Paul loves Onesimus deeply, with unmistakable affection. By the way, don't be afraid to talk to people that way. If you really love someone, don't be afraid to... I don't know what stereotypes might plague you, or what your history might be. Talking to men and women. I know men sometimes try to be like hardcore, rugged, we're tough, right? Tell people you love them, if you love them. Like, do it. Look people in the face. Tell them you love them. Paul's tougher than any of us in this room, I guarantee it. Shipwrecked however many times, nearly stoned to death multiple times. 
beaten for the sake of Christ, guys, and tough as they come, he expresses his love with such genuineness. Even poetically, he speaks his love about Onesimus. He has a passion for people. Love does with a passion for people. Again, love isn't a ticket to get you something or somewhere. If you think of love that way as, as, uh, as reciprocal, I'll love these people as long as they do something for me. Contractual, I'll give you my love if you give me your love. Then it never works. Or it might work for a season, but it doesn't work long term. Being kind to your neighbor will be so much easier if you actually love your neighbor. I know this sounds so obvious, but do you love your neighbor? I don't mean like in the same way that maybe you love your immediate family. But do you see them as an image bearer of God, created worthy of dignity and respect? Or do you see them as a problem or an annoyance? Now, that's not easy. But loving your neighbor is so much easier if you actually love your neighbor. Loving your kid, right? Like when your kid comes to you with the 200th question in the last 45 minutes, all right, all right. This is the motion you do behind your back, right? That's way easier to handle if you genuinely love them. When your spouse is grading you, but you're trying to love her like Christ loves the church and love her in a way that's godly, it's way easier if you actually love them, love people. I don't even know how to not make that basic. It's just so basic. It's almost stupid how basic it is. Love people. We don't. Right? We don't. We do, but sometimes we don't. That's a fair way to put it. We do and we don't. God says, do it more. Love more. Passion for people. Love people. Love does... With a posture of humility, love does with a passion for people and love does with the power of surrender. This is incredibly countercultural. Verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me, Paul says about Onesimus, in order that he might serve me. He was doing good. He's doing good work for me. Paul's in prison, but in such a way that some people can come and go. And he's able to write these letters and send them out. So I don't know exactly what Onesimus is doing for him, but he's helpful in the mission. He's likely doing more than just writing these letters. There's other things that he's doing, other work that he's doing while he's there in prison. Onesimus is helpful to him in this work. He says, I could have kept him. It would have been beneficial for me to keep Onesimus. <clears throat> During my imprisonment, or that he might serve me on your behalf, Philemon. Right? Like sometimes we'll talk ourselves into things like that. He said, I could have talked myself into it. I could say, well... He belongs to Philemon. Philemon's my buddy. Philemon won't care. Let's keep him here. He can serve me. It would be just the same as him serving Philemon. While I was here in prison, he's laying it on thick. But instead, I preferred, verse 14, to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own accord. Paul, this is tied to the humility piece. Paul understands that good leadership, good influence. And by the way, all of us are leaders in somewhere. I don't just mean church leadership. We all have opportunities to lead. Whether it's in the workplace, it's in our families, in a a sports team. We all have opportunities to lead. Paul understands something outrageously valuable here. It's summed up in this quote by Antoine de Saint, whatever his name is. Have you seen this one before? If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them task and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Then they'll build the boats. They'll want to. Because they want to be in the game, man. And Paul says, 
I could force you to do this, Philemon. I could compel you to do this. I could manipulate you to do this. I could flex my muscles and make you do this. But instead, I want to compel you that love is the way that walking with Jesus is the most beautiful experience you'll ever have in your life. And a piece of that, a huge piece of that is loving God and loving others. Love Onesimus. Love him. This is the way. Instead of forcing it on him, he surrenders his preferences. He surrenders his ability to command him. He doesn't manipulate. He compels. And he doesn't take what he wants. He wanted Onesimus to stay. It was helpful to him. But instead, he surrenders that. He lets go of it. And it's beautiful because that looks like Jesus. We'll be in Philippians here in a couple weeks. So I'm going to, no commentary here. I'm just going to read it. Okay, I, I can't promise that. I'm going to try to just read it. I'm probably not going to get past the first verse. Hear this. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Here I go. We live, many of us, in Barbersville, West Virginia. Got to keep up with the Joneses, right? You got to have your kids in certain sports. Those are the cool ones. Got to show up at certain things. Got to act a certain way. Right? There's a level you got to function at. Your Instagram feed needs to look a certain way. It's not just Barbersville. That's, that's, I don't mean it that way. Like, it's just bar, but that's, that's the world we live in, right? You got to keep up. And then when you don't keep up, bitterness seeps in. Rivalry. Or when you do keep up, conceit, arrogance. That's not the way. It's not the way. Like there's no joy there. There's no joy there. It's, it's black and white right here. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only on his own interest, but also on the interest of others Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself of no reputation, made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Do we grab for the crown? Or do we grab for the towel? That's back to Jesus washing his disciples' feet. They're all arguing about who's going to be first in the kingdom. Jesus picks up the towel and washes feet. That's the kingdom of God. You going for the crown or are you going for the towel? Love does with the power of surrender. Do your interactions with your neighbors and your family and your co-workers look like that? Do mine look like that? Verses 15 and 16, love does knowing the payoff is eternal. Verses 15 and 16 of Philemon, find my place. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. That's an eternal term. He's talking spiritually there. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. That's a spiritual term in Christ, especially to me. But how much more for you, both in the flesh and in the Lord, a spiritual term. If you're going to love people in the way that causes you, right, calls you to surrender your preferences. Calls you to humble yourself. Calls you to have a passion for people. I know this because I've watched so many in this room love this way. You're going to get scars. You will. You love people that way, you'll get wounded. It'll hurt. It'll sting. You got to have eternity in mind. You got to see the long game or you'll quit. You'll give up. If you don't believe that love, that your love for whoever it is that God's calling you to love is working in them by God's good grace, something of eternal value. And not only in them, but in you. Working in you something of eternal value. The act of loving. Even if the people, your neighbor, we'll just you, 
somebody's neighbor's terrible. Maybe not. But your neighbor, even if he never changes, your loving of your neighbor will change you. Love makes an eternal impact and difference in your life. You don't see the long game. If you don't see the eternal perspective, you'll give up on love. I'll give up on love. We have to see the eternal payoff. Love. Um, This isn't an excuse for Onesimus. He broke the law, right? Again, he wasn't a slave. Like, he wasn't like captive slave. He wasn't like in chains. He had agreed to do something, and he didn't do it. He broke the law. He broke trust with Philemon. He bailed out. His life wasn't great. But. But he made a promise. He fled. He didn't deserve any sort of kindness according to the law. So I'm not making excuses for him. I'm simply pointing to this reality that sometimes even in your being wronged, God is accomplishing something with eternal purposes. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament, one of Jacob's 12 sons? He's, uh, his brothers, he's got the, he's got the uh, Dolly Parton coat on, the coat of many colors. And they take him, and they beat him up, and they throw him in a pit, they put blood all over his coat, and they take it to dad and say some animals killed him, and they sell him into slavery, and he goes to Egypt, and he has a roller coaster ride in Egypt. He's in prison for a while, and then, and then he's he got some authority, then he's, then he's slave again, and then eventually he rises to second in command, remember? And then his brothers come, because there's a famine in the land, and they need food. And there they are, he can do whatever he wants to his brothers. They're right there in front of him, he has all the power. And over time, they visit a couple times, and the second time they come, he finally reveals himself. They don't know what to do. He says, you meant it for evil, remember? But God meant it for good. Joseph was able to look at the wrong that had come against him, say, yeah, y'all were jerks. It was evil, wrong, unjust. He could call it what it was and still see that God was working it out. Good, you got to see the long game. you got to see the eternal payoff of love or Love doesn't get hung up in the temporal. Love is fixed on the eternal. Those long nights, those difficult days of loving others, you got to have your eyes fixed on the eternal. So love does. Love does with a posture of humility. Love does with a passion for people. Love does with the power of surrender. And love does knowing that the payoff is eternal. But that's a heavy call. Here's the good news. This is where we close. Paul shows us an example. Verses 17 through 19. So if you consider me your partner, Paul says to Philemon. Again, he's making this this big ask. If you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. No longer as a slave. That's what's in between the lines there. Receive him as a brother, as a friend, as a fellow Christian. Receive him as you would me. And if he has wronged you at all, or owes you anything, charge that to my account, Paul says. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me even your own life. Onesimus was in debt to his master. And he refused to submit to his master. Does that sound at all familiar to my story and your story? For all have sinned, the Bible says and fall short of the glory of God. We have rebelled against our master. We have rebelled against our father in heaven, sin. And we deserve, right? Just like Onesimus, Philemon had every right to punish him for his sins. He did according to the law. Sound familiar? God has every right to punish me for my sins. Every right to punish you for your sins. We don't deserve Any sort of kindness. We don't deserve any sort of welcome. We don't deserve any sort of reconciliation. We're Onesimus in the story, not Philemon. We're Onesimus. And here comes Paul. Paul calls on the master to receive and reconcile the sinner as friend and son 
and loved one. And he doesn't just make that request. He says, I'll pay all of the debts to make it so. See what I'm saying? That's what Jesus did for you. That's what Jesus did for me. He said, welcome back the runaway Welcome back the prodigal. Welcome back the person who spit in your face. Welcome back the person who made your law a disgrace. Welcome back the person who's, who sins. Welcome back the person who hated your guts. And I'll pay for the reconciliation. I'll pay whatever the cost is for you to receive them back. How beautiful is that? That Paul's like displaying the gospel with his life. First Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sin. The righteous for the unrighteous. Paul didn't owe the debt. He offers to pay it. Jesus didn't owe the debt. He's righteous, but he gives himself for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God, being put to death on the cross in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus dies, he is buried, he raises from the dead. And today, if you're not a Christian, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you can be saved. Trust him today. I'd love to talk to anybody who has any questions about that. Don't assume, by the way, that just because grandpa and grandma and mom and dad called themselves Christians on the census report, that you yourself are a Christian. It must be a personal decision to follow Jesus through faith. If you've not made that decision, I would love to talk to you about that. Talk through that with you believe on jesus today and be saved just as quickly as he started paul wraps it up finishes the letter says yes brothers yes brother i want some benefit from you and the lord refresh my heart in christ he says if you do this it'll be refreshing to me if you welcome onesimus back it'll refresh me 21 i'm confident of your obedience he's still affirming him i write to you knowing that you will do even more than i say Verse 22, at the same time, he's going he's gonna to reserve his Airbnb, prepare a guest room for me. I am hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. He has hope that he'll be released from prison, be able to visit Philemon that likely never happens. And then he gives his final goodbyes. He says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends a greeting to you. That had been meaningful because he helped plant that church in Philemon's home. Epaphras did. They'd have been brothers. Uh, in Christ, who planted that church together. Epaphras was now in prison for the sake of the gospel. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. And he closes with grace, as Paul always does. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Love does, but only by the grace of God. So the applications are two. You already know what the first one is, because it's been the same for the last three weeks. Pray thy kingdom come. This week, every day, Pray, thy kingdom come. That's a short prayer. Meaningful prayer. Pray that to God. In particular, thy kingdom come through how I love people. Make the way I love people this week be a way for your kingdom to come. And then in the power of Jesus, let's be people who believe that love does. And so we do. Let's let's treat love like an action verb. My first piece is like a really loving call to all of us, myself included, just get over ourselves. Just get over yourself. I need to get over myself, right? Like that holds me back from love in all honesty. Uh, The selfishness that is in my own heart. What are you holding on to? Control? Holding on to some sort of reputation or even something good. I always have this image of this kid in the ball pit. You know, they used to have ball pits. That's like a COVID nightmare now. Like they'd have a ball pit at Hardy's and there's this kid in there one time and he's got like an arm full of those ball pit balls and he can't stand up. He's just like laying there and he's crying because he can't get to his mom and she's like, let go of the balls and he won't. (laughs) That's us. We're hanging on to all the stupid stuff in our lives. And it's not stupid, but in comparison to everlasting joy, it's like, why are we holding on to these things? Let it go for the sake of following Jesus. Get, let's get over ourselves. Let go of the burden of self-occupation. By God's grace, love people with eternity in mind. Who's you gonna move, who are you going to move to towards this week? 
Who are you going to humble yourself before this week? Who are you going to intentionally invest in this week? Love changes things. Philemon and Onesimus will never be the same. Their lives are changed forever by the love of Christ. That's happening in our midst, and it can continue happening in our midst as Mercy Village Church. Let's love people like, like Jesus. Love does because Jesus did, and Jesus will continue to work in us. So can you. You can love others. Let's love. Father, make it so of us that we be people who love one another, invest in one another, lay our lives down for one another. Even the difficult people in our lives. I've been a difficult person many times. Even this week, I've been a difficult person. Thank you that people are still willing to love me. Thank you you're still willing to love me. We move towards those people in our lives with love. My the beauty of Jesus' death on the cross be seen in the way we love one another. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to this feed wherever you listen to podcasts. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. And we'd love for you to experience what God is doing as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. Connect with us online at www.mercyvillage.church.